All right, hello everybody and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Andrea and I'll be your host today. So if you're not familiar with what we do here, we bring science, exploration and conservation into classrooms around the world via virtual field trips. We host between 30 to 50 events a month, so definitely check back in to make sure that there's not any other awesome ones you're missing. So today we have a very exciting event. We're being joined by Dr. Jean Terrett today. She's also known as the Frog Lady. She's joining us from South Africa, where she manages the Endangered Wildlife Trust's Threatened Amphibians Program. So the program works to conserve frogs and the various ecosystems in which they reside, and they have programs looking at eight different frog species across the country. So without further ado, welcome in Dr. Tarrant. Thank you, Andrea, and hello everyone. Uh, really great to be with you today and uh, yeah, live streaming in from South Africa. Uh, it's four o'clock in the afternoon here um, on a rainy summer afternoon. So really great to be joining you from South Africa. So I'm gonna just go straight into the, the presentation that I've prepared. Um, Andrea, let me know if we're all yep. good and you can see that. It looks great. Cool, so yeah, I'm basically gonna be talking about frogs. There's a lot to fit in. Um, really, I could talk about frogs all day, um, but just to give you some highlights about the work that I and my team do here in South Africa to protect some of our most threatened species and give you a bit of a background on amphibians as a group uh, and you know, what's happening with them around the world today. Um, yep, so that's me. Andrea's given me a little introduction. I just wanted to give a, a shout out here to the Whitby Fund for Nature, who actually put me in touch with Joe and on the seat of your pants uh, presentations. So uh, really great to learn about this, this online learning program and be part of it today. So I work for an organization in South Africa called the Endangered Wildlife Trust. We've been around for about 45 years and we work to conserve threatened species and habitats in Southern Africa and Africa at a, as, as a whole. Um, we work on everything from cheetah. So our logo is the cheetah paw print. Uh, and that was the first conservation work we did. we literally, we sold paintings of cheetah to raise money for for cheetah conservation. And we still work very much on cheetah today. Uh, and we've really expanded their range after they've been eliminated out of large parts of their natural range. And we're working to build that back. We work also on rhino, uh, cranes, you know, some of your very uh, charismatic larger species that everyone knows a bit more about. Um, and then we also work to save the habitats and the places where these threatened species live. And that also our home to, of course, many other species. Um, and we also, all of our work is also underpinned by its benefits to people. And so basically having healthy ecosystems and thriving species also means that we have a healthy planet for the rest of us. Um, so yeah, so that's all the way down to me and the Threatened Amphibian Program. We've been around for eight years. And basically we work to address some of the direct threats facing threatened species. So we use these threatened amphibian species around the country as what we call our flagships for our project work. And we also really try to link solid research with the conservation work that we're doing. And then like today in this presentation, a large part of our work is around raising awareness and doing environmental education on how important these little animals are and what they represent in terms of freshwater health. So I'm really privileged to work with a large team. They're scattered around South Africa. There are, I think, nine of us. And we also work with uh, several students and universities around the country. Um, so a really diverse group of people doing everything from social engagement through to research and everything in between. So for those of you who don't know, South Africa is on the tip of Africa. Um, we are a country, not just a region. Um, and in terms of a threatened amphibian program work, um, as Andrea mentioned, we're looking at at least eight threatened species around the country. Um, everything from the endangered Pickersgill reed frog on the East Coast. Um, that's been a focus of us for the entire time that the pro program's been running. And then more recently, the busy corner on the left um, are all our Western Cape 
threatened species. And this is work that we've just started this year, including with the help from the Whitley Fund for Nature. So really an exciting new um, part of our work, looking at some very threatened and very rare and endemic. So they only occur in very small areas in the Western Cape. As I say, part of what we do is environmental education. And so we've developed both online and for in the classroom. So if I happen to be over there with you, I could be in the classroom and actually bring some, some real live frogs into the class with you. And so we've developed this frogs in the classroom learning program, uh, and that's made up of several modules. And today I'm gonna try and sort of compress all of those into one presentation. So the very basics, because I'm sure all of you know this already. So what are frogs? Frogs are vertebrates. So just like us, they are animals with a backbone and they belong to the group of amphibians. So we'll talk a little bit more about that just now, but not all amphibians are frogs. And they are not reptiles. So we often, the study of frogs and reptiles gets grouped together under the study of herpetology, but amphibians are not in the same group as reptiles. So reptiles typically have scaly skin, they lay eggs in hard or harder shells. Uh, frogs lay their eggs in jelly-like, um, in a jelly-like mass uh, and have a semi-permeable skin. So biologically, they are a completely separate group to the reptiles. Again, I'm sure you're all familiar with the amphibian life cycle. And this is the typical life cycle where development happens within the water and adults um, are able to live on both the land in the water. But really what's important here is that this is what amphibians are. The name amphibian comes from the meaning, uh, the Greek words amphi meaning both and bios meaning life. So amphibians have really mastered being able to use both the water and the land. So the aquatic and the terrestrial ecosystems during their life cycle. And really what's key to all of this is fresh water in order for amphibians to complete their development. Typically, um, adult frogs will come together and lay eggs. The female will lay the eggs and these are externally fertilized by the male. And then development um, of the tadpoles that hatch out of the eggs after about a week can take anything between about eight weeks to up to two years, depending on the species and depending on whereabouts you are. So in colder areas, that development will take longer. So as I mentioned, not all frogs are, or not all amphibians are just frogs, but they do comprise the largest group of amphibians. So these are the tailless amphibians. We have, as of today, over 7,200 species of them. They have managed to successfully uh, colonize every part of the world except Antarctica, where it's too cold for them, um, and some of the isolated islands like the Gal Galapagos Islands. So um, frogs need fresh water, but they cannot actually survive in the marine ecosystem. It's too salty for them. So they aren't able, unlike reptiles or birds, to make their way over large distances of sea and colonize new islands. So here in South Africa, we have about 135 species of frog. Um, the, the next group of amphibian is the salamanders. We don't have any of those in South Africa, unfortunately, and I'm yet to see one in real life. So if I ever make it over to the States uh, or spend more time in Europe, these are definitely on my life list. Uh, and there's nearly 760 species of salamanders, and these are the tailed amphibians. So they look like lizards, but just like frogs, they have that life cycle and they are amphibious. And then there's this earthworm looking group called Sicilians, um, but they too have a vertebra, a, a, vertebra, um, a backbone, um, and these are found in South America, Africa, and Asia. And we know of around 214 species of these. So they're not a very well-known group. Uh, they spend most of their time underground as is suggested by their body shape and the way they look. Um, but overall, we're looking at over 8,200 different species of frogs around the world. So that's really a huge number of species that have managed to um, live in just about every kind of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem that you can imagine. So we find frogs in 
rivers, wetlands, mountaintops, grasslands, you name it, uh, we can find frogs successfully being able to live in these different habitats. So where do we find amphibians? Um, so really frogs and amphibians as a, as a whole like diverse habitats. They like it where it's warm and they like it where it's moist. So we can see there in South America, the rainforests, this is where we're finding our biggest diversity and number of species. As I mentioned here in South Africa, we're looking at about 135 species, which is not bad given that we're quite an arid or dry country. And yourselves in the States, you're looking at about 90 species of frog, but overall um, you have over 230 species of amphibian because you have 190 salamanders. So as I say, that's very exciting and something we don't have here in, in Africa. And you also have the wood frog, which is an amazing species. Um, for those of you who have heard of it, it's able to actually almost, or it does completely freeze over winter and is able to survive freezing winters in Canada and Alaska. Uh, it actually has a type of antifreeze in its blood that it's able to then essentially thaw out uh, in the spring again. So you've got some interesting stuff going on there. Um, so one of the questions I always get asked is what's the difference between frogs and toads? Um, toads are basically one of the families of frogs. So around the world, we've got about 54 families of frog or groupings. Um, and so the toads or the Buffonidae are one of those families. They are typically a little bit different looking. So they've got that glandular skin or some people like to call it warty skin and no, Frogs and toads cannot give you warts, but toads have this bumpy skin, and that's because these glands actually produce a toxin to help protect them from being eaten. So if you were to pick up a toad, you might feel a stickiness on your fingers. They start to exude a, a white, creamy substance. For you, that's not really going to do anything. It might taste a bit bitter, um, but if small dogs and cats try to eat toads, they often froth at the mouth, and it is quite toxic to, to other animals. So that's one of the defense mechanisms that toads have developed. They are also a very terrestrial group of frogs. So they spend most of their time on land. They actually have shorter legs because of this. Um, and they come to water to, to breed. Um, and female, female toads will lay egg strings. And a single female can actually lay up to 20,000 eggs in one clutch. The typical frogs, on the other hand, um, have a smoother skin, longer limbs, and are generally more associated with the aquatic environment. But again, with 8,000 odd species, you can imagine that there's a lot of variation on this. And we get frogs that are literally the size of your thumbnail all the way through to the bullfrogs, which I'll talk about as well. So as I mentioned, we have 12 families of frog here in South Africa. You can just see from that snapshot that we're looking at a really diverse group, uh, different body shapes and sizes. And these represent the habitats that they're adapted to. So on the top there, that fat little rain frog, um, these guys are really cool. Um, they spend most of their time in burrows underground. When they come out and feel threatened, they blow up into this little balloon. Um, and they actually never are found freely swimming around water. They actually complete their entire life cycle and they're breeding underground and their, their tadpoles actually develop underground as well. Um, so they don't need lots of webbing or long legs to get around on land and water. They're perfectly adapted to their underground habitat. Uh, we've got the tree frogs with their big red eyes, so similar to what, what you often see with the Costa Rican tree frog. Um, adapted to an arboreal life in the trees. Um, so you can see a really diverse range of families of frogs inhabiting these different habitats. A few fun frog facts for you, I'll say that quickly. Um, a group of frogs is called an army. Um, frogs can actually live for a surprisingly long time. So the average lifespan is four to 15 years old. And some in captivity, for example, our uh, uh, African clawed frogs can live up to 40 years in captivity. So basically when things aren't eating them, they can live for a long time. But frogs, one of their main roles in the ecosystem is to be eaten. So in, in the wild, 
we wouldn't find frogs surviving for as long as 40 years. Frogs are supremely adapted for their diet, which is largely comprised of insects. And for this, they have this really long sticky tongue that they basically shoot out to catch insects. And if you were a frog, your tongue would reach down to your waist. And frogs have around 206 bones in their body. So amphibians as a group have really been around for a very, very long time. And this is what's made them so successful. Their common ancestor literally crawled out onto land around 350 million years ago. And they are still representing this pattern through their, their life cycles today. So that use of the land and the water. And if I compare that to ourselves, Homo sapiens, we've only been around for 200 odd thousand years. So amphibians as a group have been around a long time. They're very successful. And as I say, they've managed to inhabit just about every niche across the planet. They have really developed a supreme way of locomotion. Um, as I say, there's a lot of uh, variety and diversity in terms of body shape and what different frogs are adapted to. But typically, we think of frogs, we think of these long limbs that have enabled them to be supreme jumpers. Uh, and this helps them in several ways, getting away from predators and then moving where they need to move. So frogs in general need to move really long distances between their breeding sites. So when they um, come to the breeding sites in summer, when it, it becomes rainy here in South Africa, many of these species have to travel far distances. So these long limbs really help them with that. And again, um, just to point out a South African record holder, um, this is a grass frog from South Africa. Um, you can see they're really powerful, strong back legs. This species, the sharp-nosed grass frog, holds the world record for, for long jump. Uh, and this little frog is only about five centimeters, about a, an inch and a half, um, but it can jump around 10 meters. So if you were a frog, um, basically you could leap in one shot over a football field. So really impressive. So that is a lovely chorus of frogs from South Africa. We can hear their painted reed frogs, that very shrill whistling call. We can hear some bubbling casinas that sort of um, water dropping sound in the background. And really one of the best ways for us to identify frogs is through their call. Each species has its own unique call. Um, and it's only the males that call. Females are generally quite quiet. Um, and the call is called the advertisement call. And essentially it's males advertising to females to come to the breeding site. And males have what we call a gula sac on their throat and they blow this up. Um, to make this sound. So even a small frog like the painted reed frog you can see here in the middle of the screen makes a huge noise that can be heard for miles around. Um, the guttural toad on the right, we can tell that he's a male because he has this lovely yellow throat, whereas females would have a white throat. So frogs really have mastered the acoustic space. They've mastered communicating and they were some of the first vertebrates to do this. We use this in terms of our research and monitoring of frogs. Um, and through our program, we monitor several of the species that we look at through recording their sounds. Um, and we have deployed what we call song meters, these recording devices across various sites. And we now have over 2,000 hours of frog calls to analyze. Just some more fun frog, fun frog facts. The biggest frog in the world is this, the Goliath frog. It's an endangered species. It's endangered because it's, as you can imagine, quite popular to be eaten. So these are really huge frogs getting up to three kilograms. Um, very substantial frogs that live in these big rivers. The males actually can move rocks around to make nests where the females then lay tadpoles and the tadpoles can develop in, in a quieter part of, of the river. So a really fascinating species really big. In South Africa, our biggest frog is the giant bullfrog. So I know in America, you also have bullfrogs. 
these are different species to what you have. And you can see there, they also get really large about the size of a dinner plate. These chaps also spend most of their time underground and they only come out in good rains. Um, and they are actually able to spend up to seven years underground if it doesn't rain enough. So I mentioned South Africa is actually a pretty dry country and we've been through some very severe droughts in the last few years. Um, and then we won't see these frogs coming out. This is a problem for them because in the meantime, development goes ahead, houses are built, roads are developed, and these frogs are underground. And so the species, while it occurs quite widely across Southern Africa, is being quite badly impacted in places like Johannesburg, which is being rapidly developed. The smallest frog in the world is this little Pediophrani. It's found in Papua New Guinea. And you can see there just really, really tiny fits on, on someone's fingernail, 7.7 millimeter. And not only is it the smallest frog in the world, it's the smallest vertebrate. So it's the smallest animal in the world uh, that has a backbone. Now in South Africa, the northern moss frog, which is really found from one mountain top in the Western Cape uh, and inhabits this, this mossy um, situation, um, they get up to about 14 millimeters. So almost double the size of the smallest frog in the world, but still pretty tiny. So as I mentioned, really key to the survival of all amphibian species is this need for fresh water. But as I say, we get a lot of variation on this. So we go from something like this, the Cape, um, sorry, the, the African clawed frog. You can see it's got really extensive webbing on its back feet. It has claws. It's one of the few frogs in the world that has claws. It's actually a really prehistoric and very ancient type of frog. Um, but you can see it has a flattened body. It actually has a lateral line like a fish. Um, and it spends most of its time underwater. In South Africa here, yeah, we actually call it the flat anna, which means a flat frog. So they're very well adapted to their watery environments. So we can go all the way from something like that through to species that live in the desert. This is a desert rain frog from the Northern Cape. Um, and really the only moisture that it gets is from, from the sea mist that comes in. So it's one of the rain frogs, as I mentioned, they spend most of their time underground so that they don't dry out and they live in these um, network of burrows underground. So the process whereby an egg develops into a full adult frog is called metamorphosis. There's actually several stages of development. And as I mentioned, this can take anything from between a few weeks up to two years, depending on where and what species we're looking at. This is an incredible transformation from an algae eating vegetarian tadpole that doesn't have a skeleton all the way through to this carnivorous land dwelling animal that can hop around um, on land. So it's really um, frogs or amphibians are the only creatures that go through such a transformation outside of internal development um, in terms of vertebrates. So we obviously see this kind of metamorphosis in invertebrates in our insects like butterflies that go through development with having larvae and pupa and then developing from caterpillars into butterflies but uh, frogs have this um, external development and they're only they're the only vertebrates that do this so as with all things froggy we get a lot of variety and diversity in terms of of eggs and so some species will lay their eggs up attached to uh, twigs or leaves. Some frogs lay their eggs floating on the water. Some, like the foam nest frog on the top right there, lay their eggs into a frothy mass that the males kick their legs together to make these foam nests. Some frogs lay their eggs in leaves and they actually um, develop up to tadpole stage in these little leaf nests. Um, and as I've mentioned, the toads have these strings of eggs. Um, so really a lot of variety in terms of eggs. That's just a small uh, example of, of some of that variety. Um, I keep mentioning the rain frogs. They are pretty cool. So here you can see um, this intricate um, network of burrows. They lay their eggs underground. These then develop into tadpoles in this frothy um, situation in these burrows. 
and then they develop completely underground into small little rain frogs. So they really are quite well adapted to, to that underground lifestyle. Tadpoles, we're also actually able to identify frogs from their tadpoles. And again, a lot of variety here. Um, so tadpoles um, are again adapted to their type of environment. Some live on the bottom, uh, of, like the floor of the pond or river, wherever they are. Some actually float. So this is a plucked tadpole on the left. It's got antenna. It looks a bit like a catfish. Others like the ghost frog tadpoles on the right. They've got these really large square heads um, and they actually graze algae off the rocks. So tadpoles in themselves play a really important role in keeping our water clean by feeding on algae. So amphibians as a group are really, really important in terms of the position that they hold in the food chain. Basically, they're right in the middle of, of any given food chain in most terrestrial ecosystems. So they're there, as I mentioned, to be eaten. So this is why we generally find or should find a lot of frogs in any given ecosystem. And then they themselves eat mostly insects. I think there's one frog in the world that apparently eats fruit, but most of the time frogs are there to eat insects. So they play a very pivotal role in the food chain. And if we didn't have frogs eating insects and we didn't have things to eat frogs, um, you know, by knocking out this link in the food chain, the, co the consequences are going to be pretty serious. I also get asked often, are frogs poisonous? So poisonous means if we eat a frog, um, will it poison us? Um, and in South Africa, generally no. Um, I've mentioned the toads and their glandular skin. We have many species that are very brightly colored. And this in nature is normally a, a warning of toxicity. But in South Africa's case, um, this is really just a, a, a biomimicry trick. So they're pretending to be toxic, like these painted reed frogs, where in fact they aren't toxic at all. Um, we do have this banded rubber frog that is up in Zululand, uh, bright orange and black coloring. Um, and that warning is for real. So it's quite toxic to things that are trying to eat it. Um, but again, nothing really um, toxic to humans if you handle a frog like this um, and i have picked them up as long as you wash your hands after if if i were to um, lick my fingers uh, the secretions from the skin of this frog might be uh, make me feel a bit woozy but there's nothing in south africa or the united states that i know of that can really do you uh, much harm uh, in South America, where I mentioned we get the majority of frogs, we have the group of frogs called the poison arrow frogs, and they get their name because some of them, um, especially this golden poison arrow frog, are highly, highly toxic. And that's because they've evolved where the food that they eat, so the insects they eat, are also highly toxic. So when you actually take these frogs out of their natural environment, and because they're so colorful, and um, they are popular in zoos, when they get fed normal crickets, they actually lose their toxicity to some extent. So the skin of frogs is really important. So that is where frogs that are toxic, um, the toxicity comes from their skin. But the skin of a frog is also like its own pharmacy on its back. Um, the skin produces the substances that help protect frogs from infection and diseases. And so this is now being researched quite widely. Uh, in terms of usefulness for human diseases. So some of these compounds from frog skin have been shown to reduce blood pressure. They've been used uh, in um, digestive problems. Um, and the tree frog, white tree frog from Australia, has actually been found to completely inhibit HIV transmission. So as I say, it's a very active area of research. Um, and really the take home message here is that every species of frog we lose, we are potentially losing an important cure for a human illness as well. Um, and so, of course, we don't want to go around killing frogs for their useful compounds and medicines. So what uh, research tries to do is isolate these frogs, produce these uh, compounds on an ongoing basis, and then um, 
laboratories try to recreate those um, for use in, in human medicine. So that was the sort of overall um, um, story picture with, with frogs uh, and what's happening with them. Um, but this whole group of 8,000 odd species are our most threatened group of animals on the planet. So the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, assesses all species across the planet um, based on their risk of extinction. And amphibians, the most recent assessment has shown that 41% of that whole group of nearly 8,000 plus species are threatened with extinction. 43% of them are actually in decline. So some species we're not able to assess in terms of threat status, but in terms of those species that are actually experiencing population declines, nearly half of that entire group are in decline. So why is this? As I've mentioned, amphibians have evolved to inhibit a wide range of habitats. Um, and this can be forests, grasslands, wetlands, and so on. And yet uh, humans, by the sheer fact that there's 7.7 .7 billion of us on the planet and we all need to eat and need somewhere to live, are destroying a lot of habitat that amphibians have previously lived in. So that's the main problem is that loss of habitat. And this is for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's not a great picture, and I hope you can still hear me. The rain is now bucketing down here. Um, this poor frog has been infected with a fungal disease called Um, And so we're obviously all aware of the COVID pandemic. Our poor frogs have been suffering their own pandemic for over 20 years now. Um, so this fungus is widespread, and it infects many species around the world. Um, and basically, it infects the skin of frogs, which, as I've said, is really important to the frog's biology. So this is a real problem, um, and we're seeing extinctions caused by chytrid, particularly in South America, where we also have that amazing diversity of frogs. Climate change is also an issue facing frogs. So because amphibians are so reliant on the seasons and on rain and on temperature, they are also being directly impacted where the climate is changing. And so, for example, some frogs are specially adapted to a certain altitude on a mountain um, because at that altitude, for example, you might have a mist belt and frogs then live in that mist belt. With global temperatures rising, that mist either moves up or completely disappears on a more permanent basis. And frogs are not able to adapt that quickly. So climate change is also an issue facing frogs. Um, and then the trade in frogs, so both for the food trade and the pet trade, also directly impacts on wild populations of frogs. So unfortunately, our frogs are disappearing around the planet for this wide range of reasons. Um, and those reasons often work together to make the problem even bigger. And really, this should be very, very worrying to all of us, because at the end of the day, we all need fresh water and healthy environments to live in. Um, and really that's the take home message is that without our frogs, really we all croak. Essentially where we have frogs means we have healthy environments. And so we call frogs bioindicators and they really do show us where the environment is healthy. So, it's a big problem and, you know, I think things like climate change and the loss of biodiversity can be very scary. Um, and we as individual people feel, what can we do? Um, but really, there's a lot of things that each of us can do on a daily basis in terms of our choices in what we eat and where we get that food from um, and our impact on the environment. And so really, it's to go and think a bit every day, does this impact natural spaces and natural habitats, and especially freshwater habitats. And so things like using plastic bottles, uh, rather get a reusable bottle 
um, or reusable cups that you can take with you and not have to use plastic bottles, which often end up in our freshwater systems. Really, one of the best things to do is to go out there and start being inspired by the frogs in your local area. Frogs are fascinating. Um, I've learned so much about them in the last 10 years. But when I was growing up, I was actually a bit scared of frogs. Um, but they really are amazing, and they've really adapted to this amazing variety of habitats. So get out there, put your gumboots on, get a net, and go and have a look and learn more about frogs. There is something called Frog Watch USA, and that's an awesome citizen science program that anyone can get involved in to help document frogs around the country. So check that out. And yeah, as I say, head out there, grab a torch, grab some some gumboots uh, and go and see what you can find. I think you'll be surprised um, how amazing and interesting these creatures really are. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that I didn't rush through too much and it wasn't too much to take in and that you've learned something and, and had some inspiration to go out and learn a bit more about your own frogs. Um, and I also hope that you heard that, as I said, it's become very rainy, so perfect frog weather here in South Africa. Thank you, and I would welcome any questions that anyone might have. All right, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. I know I learned quite a bit myself, and we can also hear you quite well still, just so you know. So I will bring in a few of our classrooms for questions, and then I'll also take some of the questions from YouTube. So does Ms. Jenko's class have any questions? Okay. Ab Abdul? Or Dylan? Who was it? No, no. Who she, 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 um, um, Sam, Sam, did you want to ask your question? No? Okay. okay. Abby, you had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Abby. How do you tell boy frogs from girl frogs? How do you tell boy frogs from girl frogs? So sometimes that's really easy. Um, most of the time, girl frogs are bigger than boy frogs. So when frogs have to mate, um, the male, the boy frog, has to jump on the female's back. And so this poor female has to carry this chap around. So normally in most frogs, the, the girl frog is bigger than the boy frog. And then as I said, um, boy frogs are the one that call. So they have that sack that they blow up. And sometimes that is different colors. So if you see a frog and it has a white throat, that's normally a female, and if it has a colorful, sometimes yellow, sometimes black throat, then that is a boy frog. All right, super awesome question. So let's bring Mrs. Penfold to class in. Do you guys have a question you'd like to ask? We do. All right, awesome, let's hear it. What is the highest a frog's ever jumped? The highest? Um, So frogs, some frogs can jump pretty high. I would say probably not more. Uh, you guys work in the inches feet system, right? So I'll have to think about that. Maybe, maybe like a foot high, but frogs are really good at jumping far. So they jump long. Um, and as I say, our little record holder there, the grass frogs from South Africa can jump 10 meters. Um, and I think that would be about about 12 foot so they they do leap frog over distance rather than height all right interesting so akash is joining from india and has the question did frogs have any influence over any religions or in literature hi akash that's a great question so yeah i mean frogs have been really interwoven into our cultural beliefs and myths and this kind of thing, well, for as long as people have been around. And so in different parts of the world, uh, frogs are seen differently. So for example, in Egypt, frogs were seen as a symbol of fertility. Um, and in other places, you know, they're, they're seen as a blessing because they're often seen with rain. Here in South Africa, 
Um, a lot of people are really scared of frogs and there's some genuine fears around frogs because they're associated with witchcraft, which if we think back to the Middle Ages in, in Europe was also the case. And so it's, you know, frogs being uh, cooked up by the witches and that kind of thing. Um, and so here in South Africa, we've got some real myths uh, that put frogs in a negative light. And that's also part of what we work to understand. And so some of those myths are that frogs shoot lightning out of their mouths. Uh, and that probably has a reasonable explanation in that frogs come out in rainy and stormy weather. Um, and also because frogs have those really long tongues. So in pretty much all cases where there is a cultural belief or myth associated with frogs, um, we can put that down to a, a kind of reasonable explanation. But yeah, certainly it's um, great to see uh, how frogs are, have been inco uh, incorporated into to culture over many thousands of years. All right, interesting. So Tavin is joining from North Carolina and has the question, what is the craziest frog you've ever seen in the wild? Hi, Tavin. Um, so when I started working on frogs, um, I used to go up into Lesotho and the Drakensberg Mountains. Um, and there we have this huge river frog. Um, it actually has teeth, which is quite unusual for, for frogs. Um, and they get really big. So up to similar to those uh, Congo uh, um, Goliath frogs. Um, they get really big. So that was probably pretty crazy for me coming from not knowing frogs at all to studying these huge river frogs with teeth up in the mountains. All right. So Bronwyn has the question, over time in your work, have you started seeing fewer and fewer frogs in the wild? Yeah, so essentially our work works to protect the habitats where these threatened species occur. Um, and as a general pattern, yes, a lot of these habitats are being destroyed. And so it's quite difficult to go out and count frogs at any site. Um, but really what we're hearing by people in general is that, oh, growing up, I used to always hear frogs here, or there were always frogs in my garden or frogs coming into the house, and that just doesn't happen anymore. And then in terms of of my work focused on threatened species, what we really work to do is to survey and understand more about the distribution of some of these very rare and threatened species. And we've been lucky so far, in fact, that when we start looking for more populations of threatened frogs, we do find them. But at the same time, so if I give an example of the Pickersville reed frog, um, when I started working on that species, it was known from a handful of sites all of the historical sites, all of the records from the early 1980s until 2008 no longer existed. So that's probably quite a good, good example of, of these habitats being lost um, and mostly for agricultural and, and urban purposes. All right, sounds like we should all definitely be doing our part to protect frogs. Uh, let's bring Ms. Jenko's class back in. You guys have another question you'd like to ask? Why are ghost frogs called ghost frogs? Why are, Why are ghost, ghost frogs called ghost frogs? Yes. yes. Yeah, so ghost frogs are a really, really awesome group of frogs that we have here in South Africa. They live in rivers, typically also on, on in mountain habitats. And pretty much you get one species per mountain or per mountain range. And the species that we work on is called the Table Mountain Ghost Frog. It's critically endangered. It's only know, known from Table Mountain in Cape Town. And so they're quite secretive. Uh, they're very hard to find. Um, but that species was first described from a ravine called Skeleton Gorge. And so because they came from Skeleton Gorge, they called them ghost frogs. And so they, that's the original link there. All right, interesting. Let's bring Mrs. Penfold. Would you like to ask another question? Yeah. Do frogs have ears? Do frogs have ears? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and 
Maybe I can find a picture of that. But essentially, frogs have eardrums. And so they don't have ears that flap out of their, their heads like we do. But they have what's called a tympanum. And this can be really big. It's a big round thing on the side of the head. Or it can be almost where we don't see it at all. Um, we have one species in South Africa that doesn't have that at all. And it doesn't have a call. So frogs do have eardrums, and because frogs use calls, and because calling and communication is such an important part of a frog's life cycle, um, they do have tympanum. All right, interesting. We have another awesome question coming in from YouTube. Are frogs the first indicator of climate change? And if so, what evidence have you seen that shows that? Yeah, so I say in general, frogs are good indicators of any change in the environment because they are sensitive um, because of their semi-permeable skins, because of their use of both the aquatic and the terrestrial ecosystem, um, and because of their ability in general to use a wide range of, of habitats. So as I say, in some cases, we're seeing frogs actually dying out because of climate change. So the harlequin frog, for example, um, one I think it's a species of harlequin frog actually has disappeared because of that mist belt uh, in the area that it was known from actually disappearing as a result of climate change. Um, and then frogs also are really dependent on seasonality. Um, and so where rainfall patterns are changing and where temperatures are increasing or or decreasing where we talk about climate change is not only about increased temperatures um, that's actually affecting when frogs are able to breed and then that has knock-on effects in itself so we're seeing both these direct effects where species actually become extinct in extreme cases and indirect effects where the whole breeding cycle of frogs is out of whack and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of papers um, on this around different uh, scenarios. All right, super insightful questions, everybody. I'll uh, get one more question from each of our classroom spots and then we'll wrap up for the day. So Ms. Jenko's class, would you guys like to ask one last question? Sure. How many frogs have you studied? So the question is how many, how many frogs, frogs have I studied? How many frogs have I studied? So sure, that's a good question. I don't think I've added it up uh, completely. Um, so I started off looking at these two river frogs um, up in the mountains when I first started studying frogs. Uh, and then for my doctoral study, I looked at about uh, five different species, but I also went around the whole of South Africa and was actually testing them for that that fungal disease, and that was about 20. And now we work on eight directly. So I probably have worked on directly at least 30 different species of frog. Um, but yeah, certainly I aim to um, incorporate all of the 135 species. And that's what's nice about working on threatened species. They actually are flagships or umbrella species for a wide range of other, not only frog species, but other species that share their habitat. So whether that's birds or fish or uh, invertebrates. So we try to have quite a bigger picture approach. All right, awesome. Last but not least, Mrs. Would you like to ask a question? Why do frogs eat flies? Why do frogs eat frogs? Did I hear that? Why do frogs eat flies? Oh, flies. So some frogs actually do eat frogs. Um, so most frogs eat insects. Uh, and eating flies is a really useful thing. They also eat mosquitoes. Um, I think one little study showed that a single toad ate over a thousand mosquitoes in one night. And so we certainly need our frogs around to play a role in pest control. And yeah, that's pretty much frogs have evolved to eat insects and, and that's what they do and that's where they get their food from primarily. 
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Tarrant, for teaching about us about the amazing world of frogs today, what we can do to help them, and why it's so important to conserve them. So I'll just bring our classroom in to say a final goodbye, and then that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.